This morning we are continuing through Mark's gospel. We're just about to the end. But we are moving into that area where we begin to see the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last time we saw that he was betrayed in the garden and he was arrested. Now we see him led away to uh, those who had met together in order to put him on trial. So we're going to be reading Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 53 through verse 65. Jesus Christ on trial. And we do want to remember that he was on trial for a number of reasons, but the main reason that he was on trial was for us. He was taking our place in God's judgment. This is what we deserved, but this is what he took for us. Mark 14, verse 53. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had followed him in a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, as I mentioned before, our Lord Jesus Christ didn't just begin to take the place of his people when he began to undergo his sufferings, but it was throughout his entire life, everything Jesus Christ did. He did for his people, and he did, of course, to repair God's honor and his glory and justice. Now, last week, again, as we think about Jesus standing up for us, we do need to remember that last week we saw him take a stand for his disciples, making sure that the soldiers would let them go by a display of his power. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And they fell they drew back and they fell down. And then, of course, Peter, you know, he, he uh, rises up, grabs a sword, cuts off uh, the, uh, the, the, the ear of the, uh, the servant of the high priest, and Jesus heals it. The men who saw him knew that he had power, knew he had authority. Jesus demonstrated that so that they would let his disciples go. He also, of course, reminded them, if you're looking for me, let these go. Jesus stood up for them. But we also saw Jesus standing up for his disciples by uh, willingly giving himself into the hands of these soldiers to be put on trial and to be crucified. Jesus knew they were coming. Jesus could have escaped before they got there. Once they arrived, Jesus said he could have uh, immediately called down more than 12 legions of angels. You know how powerful angels are. One of them destroyed an entire uh, army of Assyrians in one night. I'm sure he could have done it even more quickly than that. He could call down 12 legions of such angels to defend himself, but he didn't do that because it was the Father's will. And this was the reason he came into the world, to be delivered into his enemy's hands in order to, desa- to save his disciples from God's judgment. Now remember that what Jesus Christ did for them, he didn't do just for them, but he did for his entire church. He did this for you. 
He did this for me. That's the reason why we survive from day to day is because we have somebody watching over us. That's why we have everything we need in this world to take care of our needs. Jesus is making sure that you will survive as long as he wills to do his will in this world. As we mentioned before, you're basically immortal until the Lord is done with you. And by the way, when the Lord um, says it's time and it's time to come home and so forth, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Uh, my, my brother, your brother, Hal Whitehead, who's passed away, it's not a bad thing that he died. It's a bad thing that there's death in the world, of course, but the Lord turns it into a blessing. He's taken the sting out of death. We go to be with the Lord in heaven. That's a wonderful blessing. The Apostle Paul says to depart and be with Christ is very much better, and we need to believe that. But before we arrive at that very much better place, we are indestructible as long as the Lord wills that. No one can take away our lives. By the way, Jesus keeping the souls of his disciples safe also applies to us as well. Your soul is safe. You will not be cast into hell when you die. You will not be thrown into the lake of fire on the day of judgment because of what Jesus Christ has done. He has secured your safety through his life and through his death. You were safe because of what Jesus Christ did from the time he came into the world to the time he left and even now what he does in heaven. Now, as I mentioned already this morning, we're beginning to see something of the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, something of what he had to endure to bring this about. And by the way, I should also mention this. Jesus' sufferings do not begin here. You may have heard me say something about that in, in the prayer. They don't begin here, but they certainly do intensify here. His sufferings began when he entered into the world. He had to live among wicked people. Remember what Peter says about Lot and how he suffered in Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness of the people around him. Just think about the Holy One, the Blessed One of God, the Messiah, in the world around sinful people continually and how his soul must have suffered. His suffering did not begin here, but it certainly is intensified here as he's put on trial. Now, after Jesus was arrested... He was immediately taken to where the leaders of Israel were gathering together to condemn him. And I think you can understand that it's clear from the start. This was not going to be a fair trial. Jesus had not done anything wrong. They certainly knew that. They were there for one reason and one reason only. And that was to find some reason, some charge they could charge him with to put him to death. Now, they realized that in order to do this and in order to have any credibility at all in the eyes of the people of Israel whom they feared, which is why they did this in stealth and secret, and if they were to have any kind of a, um, let's say, a semblance of conscience, peace of conscience, they had to do this according to the law. And the law said you cannot condemn any man except on the basis of two or three witnesses, and those witnesses have to say the same thing. I don't know how many, if you notice how many times through here, that even though there were false testimonies and false witnesses, what they said was not consistent. They did not agree. Even in regards to the temple that they said he would destroy, the temple made with hands and then raise another one without hands, even that they couldn't seem to agree on. And of course, we know the Lord Jesus did not claim he was going to destroy the physical temple but he was talking about the temple of his body. But even if he had said that, was that a, a, a crime worthy of death? Of course not. They were just looking for a reason to accuse him. Now finally we see the high priest questioned him. And again, he remained silent. Remember what we read in Isaiah 53, that he was like a lamb before its shearers, or one led to slaughter. He did not open his mouth. So Jesus remained silent during all this, this false testimony. The high priest says, do you not hear what these are charging you with? What do you have to say? Jesus was silent. But then, when the high priest asked him this question, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered. Now, why did Jesus decide to answer then? Well, we don't read about it here, but we do see it in Matthew's gospel. The high priest adjured him. 
in the name of God to answer this question. And so Jesus was compelled to answer, and his answer was this, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now you know that that's all they needed. As far as they were, as they were concerned, Jesus had blasphemed because he, being a man, was making himself out to be God. The high priest, we might say, in a display of hypocrisy, tore his clothes. They all condemned him to death. They spit on him. They blindfolded him and began to beat him, and you can understand how that must have been. I mean, it's hard enough to be beaten when you see where the blows are coming from, but when you can't see where they're coming from, you can't really prepare for them. They mocked him, and then they delivered him over to the officers for further abuse. But again, let me just remind you at this point, Jesus didn't need to go through these things. He could have escaped. As a matter of fact, you know, as I mentioned before, Jesus said to one of his disciples, Peter, could I not at once appeal to my father and he would put at my disposal 12 legions of angels? He could have done that. Jesus was pointing out that he didn't have to go through these things, but he chose to go through these things in order that he might deliver us, in order that we might go free. Now, from what we see here, I want us to look at two things. I want us to look at something that we all know, but we you know, hopefully we'll be reminded again of who this one is that they were abusing, who this one is that submitted to these things, to see the preciousness of this sacrifice and to see the measure of God's love. But secondly, I want us to consider again why he took this abuse. Now again, first of all, who is the one who took this abuse? And as we understand what he says regarding himself, perhaps we can appreciate a little bit more what it is he's done for us. Well, first of all, he is, of course, the Christ. The Christ is, is not a name. I mean, his name is not Jesus Christ, although that's what we, we call him. Uh, but Christ is really his title. It's his mission. It is uh, what he came into the world to do. Uh, Christ, as you know, means the anointed of God, the one, as we see in John, who was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure to do a particular work. And the work that he came into the world to do is the one that the Father had been promising through the centuries from the very beginning, and that was the work of redeeming his people. The Messiah is the one that was promised in that curse upon Adam and Eve. He is the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent or would destroy the devil's work. He is the child of Abraham, that promised seed through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed, not just Jews but also Gentiles. He is the son of David who would rule the world. And of course, he is the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. He is the one the Father sent into the world, anointed by His Spirit, to do what we needed to be done and what we needed the most, and something that no one else and nothing else could do to save us from our very well-deserved judgment for our sins in hell forever. The title of Christ actually carries quite a bit with it. But we do need to realize something that they didn't seem to realize, but something they understood Jesus was saying about himself, that he is much more than what perhaps they thought he was going to be. Because they thought Messiah was going to be, I think, pretty much a man who was going to lead them against Rome and free them from political tyranny. Oh, but he's much more than that, and what he came into the world to do was much greater than that. He is also the son of the Blessed One. He is the the very Son of God. And we understand that He is in at least two different senses. He is the Son of God with regard to His human nature. Sometimes we don't look at it in that way. But remember who the father of that human nature was. It wasn't Joseph. It was the Holy Spirit. He conceived the human nature of Christ in the womb of the Virgin. As a matter of fact, that is one of the reasons why He's called the Son of God. But He is also the Son of God with regard to His divine nature. 
He is the one who has existed from all eternity, who with the Father and the Spirit uh, existed in perfect blessedness in really uh, in a place we really can't even conceive, in a state we can't even conceive. We believe that heaven is a created place and that it is not eternal, but rather a place where the Lord might put his angels and a place where he might bring us between now and the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus, or the Son of God, as, let's just say, as the divine Son of God, existed with the Father and the Spirit in perfect blessedness from all eternity. He is the one who made the universe and the world, who spoke it into existence with a word, the one who actually keeps it in existence, and the one the Scripture tells us is moving every single event in this world along according to the plan and purpose of God, according to God's sovereign good pleasure. So he's more than just a mere man. He is God in human flesh. This is the one that they had put on trial. Now what should have made them afraid was that he is also the one to whom the Father was going to entrust the rule of the nations. We've already seen he had promised David to seat one of his descendants upon his throne. This Jesus said that um, they were going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. That is the position of all power and authority, even as he commissioned his apostles before he sent them out. All power and authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. That should have made them afraid, and especially these other words, that they would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great authority. Well, what does that mean? They would see him coming on the clouds in vengeance against them for their condemnation and crucifixion of him. Now, if you'll recall from our studies in, in times, this imagery of his coming on the clouds is his coming in judgment against Israel in 70 A.D. This man, who is more than a man that they were about to condemn, is the one that would shortly return in a mere 40 years and destroy their nation. He was going to take the kingdom away from them, as you said earlier in the parable of the vineyard in, in chapter 21 of Matthew, verse 43. He was going to take the kingdom away from them and give it to a people who would produce its fruits. He was going to give it to the church. Some people call this replacement theology, but it's really nothing more than what the Bible teaches God is finished dealing with Israel as a distinct nation, although he's still saving his people from Israel, but he's making them a part of the church. The church was his ultimate goal. It's what everything, everything that God had in mind, why he said that through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So who is this one that they were condemning? Who is this one they were putting on trial? Well, he is the Christ. He's the Messiah, their Messiah, actually the one God had promised to them. He is more than a mere man. He is the Son of God, God in human flesh. He is the one to whom the Father has entrusted the rule of the nations, and he is the avenger of God. He is the one who was coming on the clouds to bring judgment against them in 70 A.D., and if you'll simply either refer to the study that we looked at before or read, uh, of course, the historians um, that recorded what took place in those days, you'll see that was a very terrible judgment upon them. So this one they were abusing is Jesus Christ. He is the avenger of God. Now, secondly, let's ask the question, why did they abuse him in this way? And why was Jesus willing to take this abuse? Now, why they abused him is a little bit different than why Jesus was willing to take this abuse. I think they abused him for a couple of different reasons. The first and main reason is because they did not see his glory. Sometimes we don't understand this. But let's ask the question, did these Jews who had put him on trial know that he was the Messiah? You know, the answer to that question is actually yes, they did know. They were without excuse for their so-called disbelief because Jesus had done everything Messiah would do. He fulfilled the scriptures that they knew very well to the T. 
And as a matter of fact, when they accused him on one occasion of casting out demons by the prince of demons, and Jesus said, you are guilty of a sin which will not be pardoned in this age or in the age to come, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the reason why they were guilty of that sin was because they knew that he was the Messiah and they knew that what he was doing, he was doing by the power of the Holy Spirit. They had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They knew who he was, but knowing who he was, they didn't seem to care that he was the Messiah. And again, this shows the deceitfulness or the evil of sin. It shows us how far sin can corrupt the mind and the heart. They were blind. They weren't blind to the fact that he was the Messiah, but they were blind nonetheless. They had the kind of blindness that we all have coming into this world where we do not see the desirability of Jesus Christ because we do not see his glory. We do not understand. They were blind. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 2.6. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There was something they didn't see, something they didn't understand, but it wasn't the fact that he was the Messiah. It was rather that glory that Jesus Christ has that we are blind to by nature, that the Spirit of God must change. The Spirit of God is the one who has to open your eyes to be able to see it. He is the one who has to transform your heart, even as Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again by the Spirit of God, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Certainly, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you go back to Mark chapter 4 or look at Matthew 13, when Jesus explains why it is he spoke to them in parables, it was in order to hide the truth from them because God was hardening their hearts, their ears, and their eyes. He was giving them over to their sins. They were under God's judgment. And that's why they were blind. That's why they couldn't see. That's why they wouldn't receive him, even though they knew it was him. They hated him. And that's why they wanted to do away with him. They were blind to his glory. So that's one of the reasons why they abused Jesus Christ. But the second reason they abused him and probably the one they would have said if you had asked them was because they were jealous. They knew that if the people received him as their king, the Romans were going to come in and take away their nation, take away their place, and so they would have nothing. The high priest Caiaphas said it was better for them that he die, that one die for the people, one die for the nation, than that we all perish. He was thinking if we just give them this Messiah, hand him over and get him out of the way, get him crucified, we'll be able to hold on to what we have. Our nation will survive. We will survive. We'll have this position. They handed him over because of jealousy. That's why they were seeking to destroy him. But finally, let's ask the question, why was Jesus willing to take this abuse? Well, you know, it's because the Father sent him into the world for this very purpose that he might suffer for us. You know, Jesus' suffering fulfills everything that we owe to God's justice. That's going to be very key, as I said this evening, as we consider uh, the idea, the Roman Catholic idea of indulgences, the idea of purgatory, things of that nature that there, we haven't made a full satisfaction. We need more than what Jesus provides. But Jesus did everything that was necessary. Jesus suffered in our place physically, and he suffered spiritually. Physically, he was handed over by these church leaders to the civil government, and before they did that, of course, they, they spit on him, they beat him, they mistreated him, they mocked him. And then, of course, he was handed over to the civil government to be imprisoned, and he was mistreated, he was scourged, he was condemned. He was nailed to a cross, he was crucified. Jesus underwent that abuse for us. And spiritually, of course, having been uh, crucified, having been nailed to the cross, he bore God's wrath 
that was meant for us, he bore that wrath against himself, even though he was the spotless lamb of God. Now again, as I've said, this is important to understand because what we need to see here is that Jesus made a full satisfaction to God's justice. And what he did, he did not do for himself, but he did for us. He did this for you if you are actually trusting in him this morning. Jesus stood in your place. He took the abuse that was actually meant for you. He was condemned when you were the one who should have been condemned. All of these things were justly yours. But he was willing to do this because of his love for you. If you are trusting him this morning. Now, as you know, in our um, series of devotions that Greg is writing on the Lord's Supper, he's keying in on a couple of things that we actually see right here. We see God's mercy and we see his grace. I think we're focusing in on his mercy this week. We'll see his grace uh, next week. But you need to realize that mercy means you are not getting what you deserved. Well, what you deserved is what you see Jesus going through right here. That's what you deserve. But God didn't give that to you. God inflicted these things on his son. That's mercy, that you're not getting it, that I'm not getting it, because that's what we deserve. And also Jesus did this in order to open the doors of heaven to you, something you do not deserve. That's what grace is. His mercy and his grace is displayed in this work of Christ. And especially, again, his going to the cross on our behalf. I think we see it there perhaps more clearly than anywhere else. And so the question that I want to ask us this morning is, as we see who this one is that is willing to take our place and realize that he is, as a matter of fact, going through what we deserve, what does this call us to do for him in return? Well, certainly, if you've already trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he wants you to do is to stand up for him and to stand out for him in the same way he was willing to stand up for you and stand out for you. Our Lord Jesus Christ not only went through these things, as we say, vicariously in our place, but he also did these things to leave us an example. We are to do what Jesus did for us. On one occasion, of course, Jesus um, stooped down and he washed his disciples' feet and he says, you should do this for one another. You should love each other. Even as I have loved you, you should serve each other. Even as I have served you, you should lay down your life for each other. Even as I lay down my life for you, Jesus says we should follow this example. We should be willing to stand up for him. We should be willing to do what Jesus would do if he were standing in our place living our lives. He also left us an example of how we should love our enemies. We're going to see, of course, examples of that as he is nailed on the cross and he, he prays to his father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, Stephen actually follows that example. When he's being stoned to death, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. And then he died. We are to love our enemies even as Jesus. We should be willing to stand up for Jesus Christ to bring the gospel to them, which is the ultimate act of love to our neighbor, but especially to our enemies. Try to communicate Christ. Try to evangelize them. Pray for them. As a matter of fact, even when they're in need, we should even do what we can to take care of them. The Lord tells us that if our enemy is hungry, we should feed them. If, if he's thirsty, we should give him something to drink. Now, if he doesn't repent, that means the Lord's going to bring judgment on him. We're not supposed to do it for that reason, but he tells us that's what's going to happen. But we may also turn an enemy into a friend. So what should we do in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us? Well, we need to understand that Jesus wants us to do more than just merely receive his love and bask in it, although we certainly enjoy doing that, because he does love us, and we should think about that and and we should be stirred up to love him in return. But he wants us to show his love also to others. He wants us 
to continue the work that Jesus Christ began in his earthly ministry. Remember, the book of Acts is not, okay, this, the, the Gospels are about what Jesus did. The Acts are about what the apostles did. That's, that's really not what Acts is all about. Acts refers to the continuing acts of Jesus Christ through his people. And we are to be those in this generation that he continues his work through. We need to continue that work that he began in his earthly ministry. We need to stand for him. He stood in our place. We are to stand in his place. Do you see the, the parallel there? Follow his example. Stand up for him. Be his hands to serve others. Be his feet to go where you need to to help others. Be his mouth to speak the gospel to others. Even as the Lord has done for you, he wants you to do that for him. And the question this text asks us, among others, is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing? It's not enough just to, even just to be willing. Will you do it? Will you be his hands and his feet? Will you serve him? Will you advance the kingdom? Will you serve one another the way Jesus Christ has served you? But this asks another question. And that is to those of you who have not yet trusted in the Savior. This is where the Lord wants you to begin this morning. He wants you to turn from your sins. He wants you, as well as those who have trusted Him, to stop living for yourself and begin living for Him, as we've seen. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to trust Him? If you are, then trust Him now. Are you willing to turn from your sins and die to yourself and pick up your cross and stand for Him? If so, then that's what you need to do. Jesus, if you are willing to trust Him, what He did, He did for you. He stood in your place. He suffered in your place so that you might be free. Now, it is true that you will lose the world if you are willing to stand up for Christ, if you're willing to trust Him, if you're willing to be a Christian, remember you have to be willing to give up everything you have to follow Him. Jesus says, no one can be my disciple who does not give up all His possessions. You need to be willing to give whatever you have to the Lord. I'm not saying, and He's not saying, that you need to sell everything and give it away. He doesn't call everyone to do that. But if He wanted you to, you would be willing to do that. But you must be willing no longer to seek for your glory, no longer to seek riches and fame and fortune for yourselves and reputation for yourself. The Lord says you need to humble yourself and make yourself of no reputation and give yourself entirely to Him. You will lose this world if you follow Jesus, but you will gain something infinitely more important, and that is heaven. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world? But he lost his soul. If you seek to gain the world, even if you gained it, you will lose everything that's truly precious because those things of the world are only for this life. They are not for the life which is to come. What really matters is who gets to be in heaven. And the only way you can be there is by trusting Jesus Christ picking up your cross and following after him. Are you willing to do that, Jesus asks. If you would see heaven, that's what you must do. Trust the Lord. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to follow this example of Jesus Christ. Again, as we prepare to come to the table, remember what he was willing to do for you and ask the Lord for the grace to be willing to do for him what he did for you. Let's, uh, let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask that the Lord might uh, take and apply his word as we need to hear it this morning.